Morton presenting his book, Elizabeth and Margaret, The Intimate World of the Windsor Sisters. It's 2.01 now, and we're going to start about three, four minutes after um, two o'clock as we have lots of guests arriving and we want to make sure that they all have an opportunity to join. So this is a very big day for the United Kingdom and the world. I hope everyone had the opportunity to watch Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh's poignant funeral this morning, how wonderful it was, the symbolism, the spectacular. So some of the things that I'm saying right now, I will be repeating, but I did want to remind you that we do have copies of Elizabeth and Margaret, The Intimate World of the Windsor Sisters in the Pasadena Public Library. And you are able to purchase them from Roman Signed. And our copies at the library are also signed as well by Andrew. So that's very um, special for us to have signed copies at the library. And don't forget you can get them at Romans if you want your own copy. So while we're waiting, I'm going to ask everyone for optimal viewing to mute themselves, please. And please um, stop your video. We are going to be recording today and the uh, recording does not show anyone's um, names or face or any information. Um, that you submitted to get your uh, login code. And it will be posted on the YouTube Pasadena Library channel so that you can share it with your friends afterwards and you can have the fun of re-watching it. Okay, so it is 2.04 and I'm going to go ahead and start. I'm Christine Reeder, Adult Services Librarian, Pasadena Public Library, and I am just thrilled to be able to welcome today Andrew Morton in conversation with Diana Nixon. Andrew Morton is going to be presenting his new book that just came out in March, 2021. We'll have to ask him how you publish a book during a pandemic, also, talking with Andrew, I realized that he has researched in the Pasadena Central Library in our history section. And he'll tell us about some of the fun things that he has found there as well. So we're delighted that he's been at Pasadena Central Library. Um, his book, Elizabeth and Margaret, The Intimate World of the Windsor S Sisters is filled with detailed, expensive, extensive research bibliography, footnotes, index, and spectacular photos that you will enjoy looking at over and over. So I've told you that today's program will be recorded and it will be put in the YouTube Pasadena Library. You please put your questions in chat. At the end of the program, I will ask the questions to Andrew and Andrew obviously will answer the questions for us. So um, I hope you know too that Pasadena Central Library as of Thursday, April the 15th, opened our Central Library for a limited express service. Our Hastings and La Pinteresa branches will follow next week on the 20th. We are still doing curbside service at all of our sites except for too. And you can go online to our Pasadena Public Library website and look for the schedule of our open hours. 
I know you know how to get to the website because you've signed up for days for today's program in the April off the shelf. So today's funeral really was most poignant to be part of Andrew Morton's presentation this afternoon, though they're not connected, but to just to have them on the same day. Uh, the funeral of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. I know you would join me in saying it was a wonderful tribute to his life. It was filled with pageantry, symbolism, and was extremely overwhelming, especially viewing Queen Elizabeth sitting by herself. So now I want to tell you a little bit about the book from Elizabeth and Margaret's close, cloistered early life through their hidden warm time lives into the divergent paths they took following their father's death and Elizabeth's ascension to the throne. This book explores their relationship over the years. Andrew Morton's latest biography offers unique insight into these two drastically different sisters. One resigned to duty and the other resistant to it. And the lasting impact they have had on the crown, the royal family, and the ways it adapted to the changing mores of the 20th century. Andrew Morton studied history at the University of Sussex, England, with a focus on aristocracy and the 1930s. Morton has written extensively on celebrity, including biographies of Tom Cruise, Angelie Jolie, Madonna, as well as the British royal family. He has written best-selling biographies of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Prince Andrew, and Meghan Markle. His number one New York Times best-selling biography, Diana, Her True Story, won international acclaim, described by critics as a modern classic and the closest we will ever come to her biography. I'm sure today's book, Elizabeth and Margaret, will become a modern classic as well. Andrew is in conversation with Diana Nixon, after conducting a 25-year career as a legal publishing executive at Thompson Reuters, Diana Nixon transitioned to working with best-selling authors and bringing their works through illuminating and engaging conversation to all of us. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Andrew Norton and Diana Nixon for their conversation about Andrew's book. Thank you so much and welcome. Christine, Christine, Christine thank Christine. you so much. Can you hear me okay? I feel, I hear a little background. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Terrific, okay, terrific. Well, thank you so much, Christine, and thank you everyone. And Andrew, aren't we lucky on today of all days, although a poignant day, it's actually a day that we all know and feel is a day worthy of conversation. I think I hear somebody's oh, phone by chance. I'm sorry, my my phone has has, has gone. Uh, I'm but we understand. Right. It's, it's Andrew, a call from outside the. I don't know how to get rid of. It. Anyway, it's gone now. Sorry. Well, that was not the introduction I was hoping for. Um, I'm sorry about that. I've come with my my entourage. Um, I think we've. Those of us who got about four, uh, 5.45 this morning had a treat in store. We watched a, a piece of history unfolding. The funeral of the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, was, to my mind, really an example of the royal family behaving as a family that were royal, not a family who were trying to um, generate publicity in interviews or on game shows. Um, they they seemed they, they gave the appearance of a very royal regal family, none more so than of course than Her Majesty the Queen alone, following the uh, her husband's coffin into St George's Chapel for what was a what I would call quite ascetic funeral, very uh, almost bleak in some ways, but but poignant and 
in its own way, life affirming. You know, Andrew, when you watch the Queen for the first time after Prince Philip following two steps behind her, as you mentioned, she's following behind him. And knowing that he has been at her side for 73 years of marriage, um, can you speak to what his legacy is? I know that he has, he's a naval war hero. It was full of military pageantry today, but also he was a reformer and a modernist in some ways that I don't think people may have realized he was before his time in many areas that we now find valuable today. Yes, it makes me smile. He, he was, um, you know, he was a great advocate for, for television. Television uh, should, should uh, monitor and film the coronation. And he got his way on that. He, he, um, he beat back Winston Churchill, his own wife, the Queen, the Queen Mother, and all the sticky in the muds who inhabited Buckingham Palace. He was the, the mastermind behind the 1969 film, The Royal Family, which showed the Royal Family off duty, going shopping, uh, having barbecues, making small talk, which was a tremendous hit. So he's always been a, a great modernizer. He's been quite progressive in his thinking. He was, you know, people talk about how difficult it is to go into the royal family, and, and it is tricky, and none more so than uh, had that that difficulty than, than Prince Philip, as I essay in the book. You know, he and, and uh, Elizabeth were, were smitten by one another, but he faced a lot of obstacles. He faced the hostility of the, of the aristocracy, the hostility of the courtiers, particularly Tommy Lascelles inside uh, Buckingham Palace. And of course, um, Elizabeth's mother and father, George VI and, and the Queen, felt that she'd you know, rather chosen the first man she'd seen. And they were not as enthusiastic as he might have hoped. So he had a tough old time joining the royal family. And of course, the back, he, he, he married in 1947, just a couple of years after the ending of the Second World War, his sisters had married German aristocrats who all um, became Nazis. Um, so they weren't invited to, to the wedding. And he was known as, um, I think he was known as Johnny Hun and the crowd and all kinds of, um, uh, just, you know, demeaning descriptions like that. But he weathered that storm, um, but it was tough for him, very, very tough. And it really shows that even though he was born royal and he was actually more royal than the queen linked to on both sides of his family to Queen Victoria, um, it's a tough gig being a royal. And you saw in a funny kind of way today that the majesty of the royal family, the might of the royal family. These were this was a, a real family um, uh, on parade, and I did find it intriguing that during the eight-minute procession behind the funeral cortege to St George's Chapel, Prince Harry and Prince William, who have not been on speaking terms for over a year, neither looked to the left nor the right because they didn't want to excite any kind of publicity but after the funeral was op yes. over the first person that just about that William was speaking to was Harry and they spoke for five minutes knowing full well that that conversation was going to be watched by the uh, TV um, and cameras so it is possibly a first tentative sign of a rapprochement between the two brothers. You know, I was wondering what you were going to think about their body language as well, because it felt, to your point about a family acting royal as opposed to a royal family, they were, I think, united in their grief and their body language of being there for each other was seemed authentic and evident to me, as opposed to knowing that the world was watching and having to play roles. Well, I, th I think they, they knew full well that the person that they were paying their respects for was Pa, the, 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 um, the, the Duke of Edinburgh, and, and nothing was going to stop them from, from acting properly. So there was going to be no conversation, no um, interchange. And I think you, you're quite right. I mean, the, um, it, it was emotional in its, in its own way, but not in the way of, say, Diana's funeral, where everybody joined in. This was just for the family. It was, it was obviously very, because of COVID, absolutely exclusive. 30 people there, socially distanced. 
and you know the social distancing that they um, that they experienced in the chapel was also matched has been matched by the social distance between William and Harry and you hope that that distance may be a little bit less less wide than it was before the funeral you know reading your book and Christine touched upon this the incredible research I know you'll talk a little bit about finding nuggets of treasure in American libraries around the United States as you did research but this fundamentally is a love story between the Queen and Prince Philip and if you could speak a little bit because your book it's so engaging from from the start but also like you know, how a case of the mumps even resulted in their chance meeting that started this love story where she met him or she felt, you know, felt attraction to him from 13, the age of 13 onward. Yes, they, they, they met at Dartmouth Naval College in the southwest of England when she was 13, he was 18, he was a cadet. And she went along with her parents and the other subject of the book, Princess Margaret, who was four years her junior. And Margaret was goggle-eyed at this, this very handsome young man, looked like a Viking, who to her mind was just a hero because he could eat not just one plate of shrimps, but two plates of shrimps uh, and still ask for more. Um, Elizabeth, as I describe in the book, was very shy, but also, and, and also at the same time was made to kind of looked younger than she actually was because her mother, the Queen, insisted on dressing Margaret and Elizabeth in the same kind of clothes, matching outfits. So it naturally made Elizabeth look younger. She was rather pink-cheeked as well, looking at this, this Viking god who bowled into their lives. Remember, as, little, as young ladies, they had very little interaction with young men, and it, that didn't really take place until you were 16, 17, 18, until your late teens. But she, she was clearly smitten. And in some of the research I did, they had a friend during the war who recorded in her own diaries that, her, that Elizabeth Bow, and this is in 1941 when she was only 13, uh, sorry, um, 15, uh, saying that um, um, Philip is, is her beau. And it's, in, it's also interesting to me as well that, that the Queen fell for the virtually the first man she'd ever met, Prince Philip, when she was 13. And Margaret fell for virtually the first man she'd ever met, Group Captain Peter Townsend, um, the, the King's Equerry, when she was 16 and when they were on a, uh, a, a, a ship, a, a visit to South Africa in 1947. She always said, you know, going riding in the morning and in the evening, that's when she fell for him. So. The psychology is interesting here, isn't it? That yes. they, they they have a very loving family in what um, George VI called We Four. Um, and both girls seem quite anxious to depart the family and make their own lives. So it, it, must have, it must have, in a way, showed the cloistered lives that they led. And they did lead uh, quite cloistered lives. Um, early on, they lived at 145 Piccadilly. Um, and then when um, the, the Duke of York was made king after Edward VIII abdicated, they moved to Buckingham Palace. And they spent, as they did at 145 Piccadilly, they spent half their lives looking out of the window at the people going by, wondering what they were doing. And the people going by would be looking in the window to find to see <laughs> what they were doing. And I'm, and I'm minded of um, Prince Andrew before he was... Um, associated with Jeffrey Epstein, was quite was well known as being a bit of a photographer, and he used to take pictures from Buckingham Palace of wow. people outside the gates, and um, and he he published them, and it was in a way they were quite kind of lonely portraits because he was stuck on his own trying to reach out via a camera lens. You know when you talk about the upbringing of of all the royals and especially here, Margaret and Elizabeth, you, they live very different lives as adults. And so they first start off as young people and they are equals, correct? Because they are co-princesses. And then in this amazing twist of fate, they become an heir and a spare and then a subject and a monarch. 
And you've painted all this in your book, which is why one of the reasons I think it's a great read is because it's all against the backdrop of World War II, the slow demise of the British Empire, the social, economic, and technological advances. So can you can you speak to how, how this dynamic between the two of them really continued on to them being adults where was Elizabeth ever envious of Margaret's freedoms? And was Margaret ever uh, envious of Elizabeth's role as the queen? Well, the answer to both, I think, is yes, but but with lots of buts and maybes. I mean, on one occasion, Elizabeth wrote to the prime minister saying, you know, I'm sick of going to these film premieres where I meet this gaster lineup of people. There's a show, the film is dreadful. You know, it's really purgatory. And Churchill agreed, and, and they immediately changed it. Her sister, of course, could go to whatever film she wanted with her friends, go two or three times, wasn't bothered. That's where the envy came in, because she just she had so much, um, uh, 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 so many duties that she had to perform of the mundane variety. Uh, Edward VIII used to say that being king was very boring over s s some very long stretches. Um, and Margaret herself, of course, very different character to Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth was a reluctant queen, just like her father was a reluctant king. And Margaret, she loved the limelight. She loved being centre of attention. And I detail the various pantomimes that they put on as, as teenagers at Windsor Castle during the war. And quite often it would be Margaret who took the starring role because she was the more fluid, the more supple actress. Um, uh, Elizabeth was rather more stiff and more self-conscious. And also in social settings, it would be Margaret who would burst into a room full of anecdotes and making some uh, remark that has everybody laughing. And in a way, Elizabeth who was very shy, um, used her sister as a prop to help her get through these social occasions. So, you know, Yes, people have said, what would it have been like if Margaret had been queen? Well, it would have been probably a bit more fun, but it might not have, it would have been a, a bit like the, the court of Louis the Sixteenth. it might not have lasted very long. Um, she, uh, uh, it, she was, and, and this is a central difference of the, of the two women. She was very much a metropolitan princess. She loved going to the ballet. She was a patron of the um, Royal Ballet. She loved going to the theatre. She loved singing and carousing till the early morning. I mean, she'd be going to bed <laughs> and just as the queen was getting up to walk with Claude or to, to, to have to have a breakfast before meeting her private secretary. So they there was a real yin and yang there between the two women. And there was this step change. This is the central and interesting point about it. I started off by thinking, okay, let's do this compare and contrast, William and Harry, um, Meghan and, and uh, uh, Catherine. Uh, uh, Sarah Ferguson and Princess Diana, and then you've 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 got Bertie and you've got Edward, and and also you've but most intriguing of all you've got Elizabeth and Margaret, who one becomes a queen, one stays a princess. Has that happened in the past? Well, the answer is no. This is a unique double act. They're a salt and pepper uh, couple, um, and th there is a step change in the relationship when. Princess Elizabeth becomes the queen prematurely in 1952. And so now Margaret has to curtsy to her, um, pay obeisance to her. And there's a, there's a picture in the book showing Margaret at the coronation and she's looking pretty miserable. And she's asked by her lady in waiting, you look pretty miserable. And she says, yes, I was because I was, I was, I was losing my sister. So, and she did lose her, uh, her sister now was two people. She was a human being, her sister, but she was also the head of state, the monarch, uh, the, the woman who had to uh, obey a, a certain course of action, be it about marital affairs, political matters, and, and, and uh, um, neutrality relating to that. You know, you write in the book that, uh, that Margaret says that she wants to be known as the sister, I'm sorry, the king's daughter, but not the queen's sister. And to me, that statement, if you could speak to that, and also a parallel even with William and Harry, and 
sort of the, the difficulty of finding your place in the world as the, as the sibling to the monarch? Yes, it, it's, it, uh, it's a tough gig being a royal, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it, all, it seems fun, but it's, it, it's not really. And for Elizabeth, she was struggling to find a role when the queen, when Elizabeth became queen, because there is no preordained path, and she she was always going to be number two. She was always going to be the wingman for the queen. She was always she was never going to be the star of the show, as much as she she you know she had this great vivacity, so a great extrovert, loved to command the, the 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 room. She was always going to have to be the one who curtsies. And you've you've got a similar thing with Harry and William. William and Catherine will always be the future king and queen. Harry and Meghan will always be um, somewhere down the, the royal totem pole. I think it's sixth now, he's sixth. And, um, and, and that's what Margaret was referring to when she said she's happy to be the king's daughter, because that meant that she was still a member of the primary branch of the royal family. But the queen's sister meant that she was ancillary. She was she was moving further and further down. So when Prince Charles was born, she moved down. And when Princess Anne was born, she moved down. And similarly, Prince Andrew and then Edward. So she kept moving down. She became, she became literally less relevant to the monarchy with each birth. And yet, and we can use the parallel here with, with, with uh, Meghan and Harry, yet when she married, um, Tony Armstrong Jones, the photographer, Lord Snowden, they were incredibly popular. They were the most glamorous thing that's ever happened to the royal family. You know, the nearest equivalent to them was um, Elizabeth uh, Taylor and Richard Burton. And it was also the birth of the paparazzi. So they take long distance shots of Princess Margaret water skiing. You never imagined Princess Margaret water skiing, but there she was water skiing on just off Windsor Great Park. And uh, or on holiday in Italy. And, she, you know, they would take private jets, go to private islands. This glamorous life in the 60s was just unheard of to most people when most people had never been abroad um, in Britain. You know, when you talk about all the differences between the sisters and how it compares to trends and, and the way the royals are living even today, it makes me so happy that you are serving as one of the consultants, as the consultant to the season five of The Crown, because I think so many people get their knowledge if they're not as well versed as, as we all are in reading these books from The Crown. And if you can speak about that experience serving as a consultant and where actually The Crown has in previous seasons maybe gotten some things wrong that you have written about in your book that people should really read because it's fascinating to read what the true story is. Yes, well, I'm, I'm very um, honored really to be asked to help out with the, with the with the season five. Season five takes you up to the publication of my seminal book, Diana, Her True Story, which was done with the intimate cooperation of Diana, but very secretly. So there's a drama there. There's a drama behind the Panorama documentary that, were, that um, Martin Bashir conducted, where Diana um, really uh, gave, gave herself problems going forwards. Um, so that yes, it's, it's a, it is an, it's an exciting um, experience and it does put you on your mettle because you have a, a Zoom meeting with about eight script writers, all of which, all of whom have got very arcane questions to ask, such as what, what was, what kind of wallpaper did your daughter have? In your house, so there's, a, there's a, it's it's both a trip down memory lane and it's a chance to be involved in what is a, I, I consider to be a very exciting project, which which for all the people saying oh the crown gets this wrong that crown gets that wrong, showrunner Peter Morgan has done an absolutely stellar brilliant job. I've you know I can't praise him highly enough for bringing the royal family into the 21st century. Uh, making it relevant, making all these secondary characters like Princess Margaret, like Princess Anne, making them relevant, making so that people watching today know who they are because they've seen something of them on, on, on TV. Um, can you talk about 
the Peter Townsend situation and what actually happened. And the reason that relates is so important is because I think what happened there and then her subsequent decision to marry Tony Armstrong Jones, it's such an interesting turn of events and then really kind of leads to how she ends her life, which is, you know, a sense of poignancy of, of, of living an exciting, incredible life, but also laced with sadness. Yes, that was a good phrase, that lace with sadness, shot through with sadness. I mean, it, she had a sexy life, a romantic life. Um, uh, she had great loves, great passions and great failures. And one of the great passions, the first great passion was with group captain Peter Townsend, who was initially the king's equerry. He was married, he had two children, two boys, and she fell in love with him. And that love deepened after George VI died and also after Peter Townsend um, was divorced. And it was at the coronation where an eagle-eyed reporter saw Margaret knock some fluff off um, Peter Townsend's RAF uniform. He's a, he was a pilot during the war, um, much bemedaled. And it, it, that was the starting gun on the, the speculation about their relationship. Now, he was recently divorced. And at that time, remember, we're still in the, the dark shadow of the abdication from 1936. At that time, it was divorce was unheard of inside the royal family. And to, to the idea of marrying a divorced man was not really thinkable. Um, and even the Church of England, until relatively recently, wouldn't allow you to marry uh, inside a church if, if you were divorced. She went to the Queen, and this is where the, there's a step change because the Queen is no longer just her sister. She's the Queen. She has to obey the Royal Marriages Act, which says that she must give her permission until the age of 25 to whom you want to marry. Now, Margaret is only 23, so she has to wait two years. And then after that, she's also previously informed that she might have to give up her civil list. That's the money she's paid. Uh, she might have to give up her title, Princess Margaret, her appellation, her royal highness, and her place in the line of succession. Now, there's a twist. Anthony Eden, the new prime minister, looks into the case and thinks this is very onerous. And he has his, his legal team look at it. And they came to the conclusion that if um, Margaret just gave up her position in the line of succession, she could marry Peter Townsend. The Queen had no objections. She wanted her sister to be happy, and she made that known to Commonwealth leaders. And so there was a there wasn't a conflict between the two sisters. There was a actual uh, working together in this very important subject. And the one person who was kept in the dark was Peter Townsend, because in the obverse of the abdication, where Edward VIII abdicated without telling Wallace Simpson. So Margaret um, decided against uh, 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 thinking about marriage, even though she had to give up very little, she only had to give up her position in the line of succession and never really told Peter Townsend. So he remained on in the dark until his death. So it's, a, it's, it's kind of like a modern, very modern version of, of an old story where it's the, the man who makes the decision. This time it was the woman. You know, although Margaret, as you mentioned, was seen as more progressive and forward thinking in terms of her lifestyle, the irony in many ways is the queen as a working mother and juggling a lot was sort of the new breed of modern woman at the time. So can you speak to that sort of irony and, and, and that dynamic and how each of them were perceived? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the queen, when you stand back and look at it, she had to give up her role as mother just about. I mean, think of when you see a presidential diary, it says at 10.01, the door will open. At 10.02, the president will greet the ambassador to wherever. At 10.15, the, the president spoke to so-and-so on the telephone. That's that's in roughly the way the Queen's Day goes. At 10 o'clock, she sees her private secretary. At 10.15, she will take an investiture. At 11 o'clock, she will meet whoever, the ambassador to whatever so her days are laid out and it meant it's squeezing her other function which she loved being a mother and 
she had to change her audiences with Winston Churchill so that she could actually spend half an hour with them every day. And they ended up being largely brought up by the Queen Mother and also by Princess Margaret, who was very keen on the education of Anne. And it's kind of an unknown story, this. Margaret always resented the fact that it's her big sister got the education. She was the one who was taught by, you know, the head of Eton uh, College, constitutional history and history. She was taught French country songs. And she resented that. She had an, an inquiring mind and she wanted Anne not to be, not, not to be uh, raised and educated in a palace. And she became the first princess to be educated outside a royal palace. And that was, that was largely at um, um, Margaret's doing. You know, it's interesting you mention that because the World War II and actual family history reveals how close a second sibling especially before marriage, actually could assume the throne. I mean, she literally was a heartbeat away because didn't most recently to Elizabeth and Margaret, they have two other relatives, both named George, who assumed the throne, who were not um, in direct line? Absolutely. Margaret always thought it was very short-sighted of her father, who she adored, and her mother, for not giving her the education that she required. Because after all, I mean, it's difficult, it's different, it's, it's so difficult at this distance to imagine the day-to-day -day tension of possibly being blown up by German bombers during the war. You know, Buckingham Palace was hit on numerous occasions. George VI narrowly escaped being killed. Um, he traveled everywhere with a machine gun. Windsor Castle was bombed on numerous occasions. So, you know, it, it, the, the, the Queen wrote to Princess Elizabeth and said, look, if I die, I want you to look after your sister and look, here's, this is where my jewels are. You know, so it was, it was, it was down to, everything was down to life and death. And as you mentioned, George VI and George V were second in line um, and they were promoted because of the deaths and also abdication of the other. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Margaret was just a heartbeat away and she resented the fact that uh, she was just left to her own devices as she was when she became an adult. And, you know, she was this glamorous, very, you know, bedecked in furs and high heels and looked glossy and beautiful. She would tease the press by going out with six or seven aristocratic men at, at night so that they'd be saying so and so Lord Dalkeith for example is Earl Dalkeith is dating her then it would be some other guy and she just teased them and after the end after the ending of uh, her relationship with um, uh, group captain Peter Townsend she was at a she she felt that she was being left on the shelf and she fell quickly for um a very unusual character, uh, Tony Armstrong Jones, something of a, a real hedonist. Um, he was bisexual. Um, during his engagement to Margaret, he was still having an affair with his with his best man and his wife, and she became pregnant, and the baby was born during um, the, the 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 honeymoon on board the Royal Britannia. Of Margaret and Snowden. So, you know, I, I I call a title, I entitle a chapter Sex, 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 and I think that's an underestimate. So there's, you know, there's there's the formal stuff and there's a lot of informal stuff going on. Well, you know, and as their relationship unraveled, Tony Armstrong Jones and Margaret, what was difficult, I think, is the Queen and the Queen Mother did not see that side of him. They thought still that he was the lovely cavalier, devoted. A charming family member. And Margaret, we know, has struggled with mental health issues. We know Diana um, did. Uh, Megan has also indicated in her interview that she has struggled with those. And the institution seems to have continued to be unresponsive and unsupportive. Can you, can you address that? Because it seems like we all wonder, like, hasn't anything changed at all during this time? Well, the, I, th I think there's a general philosophy inside the royal family that, you know, unless you're chronically ill, you 
get get your game face on and you get on with it because hundreds if not thousands of people will might be turning out for you you know that there's pressure on you all the time to turn up to shake hands to um not let people down and so you know if you're too cold put on another sweater if you feel sick take an aspirin um that's been the philosophy and there has been a reluctance to to acknowledge uh, more deeper concerns that said i think recent history shows that both harry and uh, william who set up the Heads Together Foundation to address mental health issues, to address these issues that are in the shadows, um, have made some some progress. Although, given the uh, Oprah interview, you wonder how much. What do you think of the Oprah interview? Well, I I, I felt that they they were speaking their truth, but it was their truth. It wasn't the truth, and I had the same issue with. Princess Diana, when I was working with her for her biography, Diana, Her True Story. Note the title, Diana, Her True Story, not Diana, The True Story, because that's the title Diana wanted. And I convinced her that she should call it her because it's from her perspective. And it's a similar thing with Meghan and Harry. It's from their perspective. It's not necessarily factually accurate. It's not necessarily uh, fair, but it's the truth as they see it. And it's part of a modern trend to think that because you feel something, that's an objective truth, which I, as a, as a journalist, as a reporter, I, I would dispute. You know, the, the, when you read your book, you read about the way the different private secretaries, the administration of the firm, they are there sometimes as a support, sometimes like more pressure almost on the members of the royal family. Can you talk about their role? Or do they, because it seems like they have their own interests as a, to protect the institution going forward. And yet you're dealing with humans that have flaws, that have emotions, that have feelings. And how does that all work behind the scenes? Well, let's just take one of the characters from The Crown, my favorite, Tommy Lascelles, the guy with the mustache. His primary function was to defend the monarchy and to defend the monarch. So anything that contradicted or, com or, or, or went against that, he would be up in arms about. So, for example, when Prince Philip, who I mentioned at the start of this talk, had a tough time entering the royal family, wanted to stay at Clarence House, which had been their house since they married, um, rather than moving to Buckingham Palace, which they found a chilly, you know, booming, uh, soulless place, uh, Tommy Lascelles told them, no, you are the queen. The, the nation expects you to be at Buckingham Palace. It's Buckingham Palace you will go to. And he had the support of Prime Minister Churchill. So that's one example of where the, where the private secretary, and you could argue, well, this, this is... Um, uh, very arcane, but where they have a, a lot of influence. Because remember, they're the ones who liaise between Downing Street, which is where the Prime Minister resides, the Foreign Office, various others. They're the oil the, that keep the whole thing running. Diana used to call them the men in grey, and she didn't have much time for them. Um, these days, the the, 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 the the origin of these characters is not eaten the guards, Oxford and Cambridge, you know, uh, the, the county set with, with a stately home lurking in the background. They tend to be diplomats, um, people from uh, the, the government, and it's for them, it's, it's a profession, it's a job. So, and, and, and they, they're not particularly, they don't particularly have a, a strong view either way. They're, they don't bring their prejudice into, into it. So I think one of the things of note over the last few years has been the professionalism of of the courtier class inside Buckingham Palace and I've, I've uh, had some of the briefing notes that were given to all the journalists and writers before the funeral and it, they were very they were very forthcoming very open very matter of fact very slick very professional I mean the White House would be well 
it's probably slicker than the White House. The White House would be proud anyway of the way yeah. that they put the whole presentation together. So there is this kind of caricature of the men in grey, and mm -hmm. you know Diana had it uh, 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 as being these fonts of all evil and, and machinations. Mm -hmm. And yes, don't get me wrong, like in any office, there's office politics, and there are a series of offices. There was. You know, there's Prince of Wales's office, there's the Queen's office, and they've often been at loggerheads over the years. And traditionally, the Queen or the King is usually at loggerheads with her, uh, with the successor. Successor. You know, has members of the, have members of the royal family actually internalized some of this protection of the monarchy themselves? If you look at Prince Philip, and I know you've seen letters that Prince Philip had written to Diana trying to help her, but then when Diana went public. There, there, and Margaret, who was a great mentor to Diana, and when Diana went public, basically they just turned on her. I mean, for they just maybe not as much Prince Philip. You can address that, but it seemed like Margaret just cut her off because she, you know, it, she was airing the 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 laundry that they didn't want the, out in public. Well, absolutely. I mean, Princess Margaret, and as I describe in the book, was was a great uh, friend to Diana in the early days. They lived next door to one another. They go to the ballet together, they go on engagements together or share cars, share planes, you know. And and uh, Diana said to me, you know, I love Margot, I adore her. She's helped me so much. But Margot's first loyalty was not to Diana, it was to the Queen. And initially when Charles and Diana separated, she took, didn't take sides. She wrote to Prince Charles and said, um, uh, I'm still going to be in touch with your wife. I'm still going to go out with her. But when she secretly uh, went on Panorama and made the film, uh, the not 50 minute uh, uh, conversation, where she talked about Prince Charles not being fit to be king and wanting to be the Queen of Hearts, that's when the guillotine came down, when the shutters came down. Um, she just felt that it was an absolute betrayal of the Queen. And that is central. And that's what you saw today, that the, the sun about around which every, everyone uh, uh, circulates is the Queen or the King. And that's what how Margaret felt. It was that, that Diana was trying to be her own sun and planets, and she wouldn't have it. And you notice, and, and at her funeral, at Diana's funeral, Margaret joined the Queen out standing outside Buckingham Palace, but whilst the Queen bowed her head, Margaret didn't. She just went, it was the merest, merest gesture, as though she's about to sneeze. You know, that's another um, poignant part of reading your book is they have these interesting dynamics as siblings that you know you that you have these public personas, but yet behind the public personas, like in Margaret's case, she would spend time with Cambridge and Oxford Dons. She was interested in theology. You have, uh, you have Elizabeth dancing in Malta and having a good time. So you have these private personas that are different from the public and interwoven is this loyalty. I mean, back when, when the queen was waiting for her, for Philip to come back when she was in her teens and her parents were maybe not as supportive of that relationship. Um, there's Margaret saying, talking about how great Philip was. And so when Philip came back into her life after his tour of duty in the, as part of his naval duty, um, you know, the, Margaret did her part to be loyal to the queen. And then at the end of Margaret's life or after her divorce from Tony Armstrong Jones, when she met Roddy Llewellyn, who was much younger, and the queen understood his role and was loyal to her. At the, just this whole thread of, despite the intense emotions and dynamics all against a world, a world history, this loyalty, this loyalty for the well, yes, There was loyalty there, but uh, just to put it in perspective, there was also a conflict. And her relationship with Roddy Llewellyn, this out of work gardener, who was 13 years Princess Margaret's junior, really upset the Queen because she just thought that Margaret was not doing herself any favours and not helping back to this concept, the monarchy. And she said to her private secretary on one occasion, what are we going to do about Margaret's gutter snipe life? Mm 
And <laughs> there was real conflict there and real concern in the media about Margaret. And there was even in Parliament moves to have her stripped of her civil list payment to be made just a private citizen because they thought that her, her behaviour was scandalous. Now, these days, toy boys and uh, cougars are all part of the, you know, the, the, the rhetoric of daily life. But in those days, it was unheard of for a princess to be cavorting on a beach in the Caribbean with a young man uh, many years her junior. And the irony is, of course, he never divorced. Um, he wasn't cruel to her. He was very kind to her. He supported her after she'd had strokes. Um, he went off and married somebody else, some, somebody near his own age. Uh, but he always remained loyal to her. And he's the queen who actually learned a lesson from that relationship. She said on the day of Margaret's funeral, she said to Lady Glen Connor, Anne Glen Connor, who introduced Roddy to, um, to Margaret many years before in Edinburgh in Scotland and um, the Queen said thank you for introducing Roddy to Margaret because he, he made her very happy and I think that you know over the years the Queen with her Anna Cerebralis in 1992 with the divorces of um, Princess Anne, Prince Andrew, Prince Charles you know was was grateful that um, her sister had also been loyal to her and she learned a lesson that her sister was often one for, for, for grasping the nettle and making a decision, whereas the Queen was a great one for kicking the, the can down the road, as it were, and hoping for the best. You know, it brings us back to today and you see that the Queen is walking alone. It was poignant, as we said, you know, she has her children, her grandchildren, her great grandchildren but she is alone. And as we look to the future, what do you think is going to happen next? And the title Duke of Edinburgh, I know Charles has it right now, but what is the plan? And what do you think the, fam the royal family is gonna look like in the short term? And you know, going forward, what lessons from your book actually could help you know, Charles and Camilla and then William and Kate? Well, I think going forward, you're going to see a, a, a very much slimmed down monarchy. I don't think you're going to see an awful lot of the Queen, that when the Queen does appear, she'll be with a with a senior member of the royal family, some of her children, certainly for the next while. But she's a very matter of fact, very stoical person. Um, and she'll have, she will have come to terms with this you know, some weeks before the rest of us have, because she's seen at first hand Prince Philip's sad uh, medical deterioration. As for the monarchy, I think that you might call it there's going to be like a soft regency. And by that, I mean that Prince Charles and his son, William, will do most of the heavy lifting. They'll do the foreign trips. They'll try and keep the Commonwealth together. They'll uh, do the investitures. The Queen's future plans, immediate plans are to remain at Windsor Castle. I think that you're not going to see her at Buckingham Palace very often. It's going to be more the office block. Um, the, the, quite, frank, quite frankly, should have been years ago. Um, and she's going to live at Windsor Castle. Um, she will do, do fewer and fewer engagements. And you're going to see a lot more of Charles and Camilla, who are King and Queen Camilla. Why do you think it should have happened a lot sooner? When you mentioned the move to Windsor I, I've Castle. Always, I've always felt that that um, Buckingham Palace is, and this is just my opinion, is a, is a, is perfect for great state events, obviously, uh, but it's also great as a museum, as an art gallery, um, not as a family home. The family homes should be places like Clarence House, um, Windsor Castle, uh, where they've where they've got um, you know broad acres to make themselves scarce. You know, I wanted to turn to some questions about, about you and about your process and about your life as a royal biographer. Um, so the New York Times has dubbed you the king of royal tea. So I, which, ro which royal would you most like to have tea with and why? Well, obviously the person who's well known for afternoon tea is Her Majesty the Queen. So you, you're assured of a, a decent cup of, of uh, English breakfast tea 
and some well-made sandwiches. So she, and it would be nice, to, but, and she always uses afternoon tea as a time to catch up with all the gossip. So you, you could reverse it. And, and, I, and someone else who, as I understand it, has got her way into the hearts of the royal family is Camilla, because she's a great enjoyer and a great conversationalist, very chatty. And she was one who took um, Kate under her wing in, in the early days, and to a degree, Meghan. So after all these years of covering the royals, what, what has most surprised you about them? Well, what, what surprised me about the royal family is just how difficult, something which I'm, I never really properly appreciated is just how difficult it is to become, to join the, the royal family properly and authentically and to absorb and how many years it takes. And, I'm, and I was minded about that just the other day. I don't know, people watching today might have seen a picture of uh, Catherine and William walking down the aisle at um, Westminster Abbey the other day. They've visited a COVID-19 um, vaccination centre and they looked every inch the future king and queen. And it just struck me then that it's taken Catherine 10 years, because it's their 10th wedding anniversary in, in a few days, um, 10 years just to feel comfortable in her own skin. And it took Diana a similar amount of time as well. She found the first few years just an ordeal. Megan, she she um, she found it too too difficult to cope with from the start. You wonder if, based on all that has happened and the fact that it does take time, that will the 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 men in grey, the new men and women in grey, and the new iteration will they try to help future generations? kind of onboard more quickly or uh, help them acclimate because it seems like now they're on notice that it does take time and maybe they can help move it along faster for future generations, who knows? Yeah, who knows? I mean, you know, I think this, there are still many stories to come out from the Meghan debacle, uh, especially as there's, well, there's an inquiry into her possibly bullying members of staff. So we don't know the answers. Um, I found it very sad uh, speaking personally, that a hometown girl, Pasadena girl, really, she she was a homecoming queen up in La Cañada. Um, she was in plays around here. She visited the uh, uh, Rose Tree Cottage tea rooms um, to learn how to drink tea. So yeah, so she's a local girl made good, and and uh, well, she's now just up the road in Montecito. So. It'd be interesting to see how her journey pans out and that of Prince Harry, of course. You know, I have one last question about your life as a royal and that, and working with royals. And I know that you've met the queen before. And I, I thought if you could speak to that experience of what is she like um, being in her, in her, being in the same environment as she is in person? Well, it was a very exciting day. It was my first ever major royal tour in February, 1983. And the Royal Yacht Britannia came from, I think it was Mexico, into the harbour at San Diego. And this beautiful, or rather Edwardian looking yacht, surrounded by all this flotilla of, of local craft. I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. I'd like to read a book about that, about that, about that boat. And there wasn't the book. So I thought, well, I'll write one myself. So I ended up researching the history of the Royal Yacht Britannia and the, and the life of the royal family on board. And on that day, I was you know, honoured to, to meet Prince Philip and um, the Queen. And we ended up, you know, the conversation was about the size of the American Navy because there was just dozens of warships parked there. But th there, was, there was nothing of substance. But, it, you know, it was because you, you, you're always very nervous when you meet the Queen. You know, when, um, when you write biographies, and I want to know what the next subject matter is. I look back also of, of what you've written and really, you know, from uh, 17 Carnations through to Wallace Simpson, through to, uh, to the Diana book. Could you share a little bit of your, of your story becoming a royal biographer in terms of how you've picked those subjects and really how it's led you to Elizabeth Margaret and what's next? Well, 
the, this kind of royal theme, obviously I've been writing about the royal family now for, for what, 40 years, dates me, doesn't it? I started out as a royal reporter on newspapers, then I started writing books. I've mentioned the, one of the first I wrote was on the Royal York Britannia. I then started writing, I wrote the first biography of Fergie, broke several stories relating to her and her romance with Prince Andrew, and then became friendly with Diana's set, and then was invited to start interviewing Diana. And that's a whole another story. Uh, uh, and wrote a few celebrity books, but realized that, you know, that there's a lot more that I, that I was still writing a lot about the royal family. So it was time to explore that again. And I was intrigued by the Duke and Duchess of Windsor and their links to the Nazis during the, the before and during and after the Second World War and found a, a fascinating story to tell there. That led me into information about Wallace Simpson, going to libraries in, in well, starting off actually, Pasadena, upstairs in the, in the history section. Um, but also going to libraries all around America, because I discovered that quite a lot of English history is buried in some of the libraries, like the, like the Hoover Institution up in uh, uh, the, up on the West Coast at Stanford. Um, uh, and, and, and then obviously Megan, Megan lives nearby, nearby homecoming girl. And then this book, uh, Elizabeth and Margaret, I was intrigued because of the compare and contrast between uh, the Queen Mother and Wallace Simpson, the compare and contrast between William and Harry. And who's the original compare and contrast? Who are the original salt and pepper royals? Well, it's Margaret and Elizabeth. So that brings you back full circle. Yeah. And then finally, what are you working, what are you going to be writing about next? Well, um, I'm, I'm intrigued about Winston Churchill, so I'm going to take a look at him, a specific aspect of his life. Well, we look forward to that. And um, Andrew, I mean, I know this has been such a wonderful conversation. I'm so excited to now bring Christine back and have her share with us any questions that she or any of our um, of our fellow attendees may have for you, Andrew. Thank you, and thank you for, for that uh, illuminating series of questions. Thanks, Diana. Thank you so much, Andrew. It was a fabulous um, conversation with Diana. The questions were very, very engaging and brought a lot of things to light for us um, and that are touched in your book. So if people want to read more about some of those different um, questions and answers, please get um, one of the, uh, please get the book, Elizabeth and Margaret to read and um, go through all of the bibliography for future reading. So if anyone has any chat questions, please put them in the chat to me. Um, and while I'm waiting for a question, I thought I would ask you about, um, Prince Philip had a, the Duke of Edinburgh Award and he, his really was to promote young people for essential skills, experience, confidence, and resilience. Who do you think is going to take over that? I believe that started back in 1956. Is someone going to take that over or? Well, it's, it's been taken over by Prince Edward. He's been running. Oh. And so that, so in answer to, to actually Diane, Diana's question about um, the title Duke of Edinburgh, it's, it's uh, thought that Prince Edward, the youngest and probably the least known of the Queen's children will take over uh, as patron and uh, of the Duke of Edinburgh, but also the, the the title Duke of Edinburgh. Oh, and so he will continue it, and it's probably being continued right now because yeah. it's too too important of a project to stop. And it's, it's a great project. I mean, I'm sure many people watching this have had their children go off into the night, clutching their rucksacks and wondering if they'll survive a night in the wild. Uh huh. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, when we were talking a little bit before the program started, you talked a little bit about the biography that um, you looked at at Pasadena Central Library. Can you tell oh, us yeah. a little bit about that one? I thought that was very interesting. I often find that a way of approaching a subject is to go kind of a little bit off beam, a little bit off beat. 
So I like to look through, for example, a biography of President Nixon, because he at some point had designs for his daughter Trish, or Trisha, to marry Prince Charles. Right. And so wow. were, were, there, were there any little anecdotes to do with that? And then I was looking at a biography of uh, Pre President Carter, and he reminisced about a meeting with the Queen at Buckingham Palace, and how the Queen said to him that she couldn't afford to put on weight or lose too much weight or change her figure too much, because she had, as you can tell from, from uh, the, the, the pictures today of Prince Philip's uniforms, so many different uniforms to wear during the course of a year. And so she didn't want to have the seamstresses and all having to change things. So, so, so she has a very well-organized diet. She keeps, sticks to the same dietary plan, never gains or loses any weight. So that, and this is back to, you know, not wanting to, to, to inconvenience people. She wants, everybody knows where they stand with the queen. They know where they stand with regards to her temperament, to, with regards to her weight, with regards to her dietary requirements, she's a, she's easy to look after. They all, everybody, anybody who's worked at Buckingham Palace, who's worked for the Queen, that I've spoken to, have always said that she's she's their that she is their favourite because she's you know she's easy and she's also thoughtful. Oh, that's very interesting. Well, she's also had lots and lots of prime ministers that she has. Um, Yes. Had to get, get used to or interview or having have her conversations from, with? From memory, I think it's 14. Um, but somebody can match that. But, but Jim Callahan, who was a Labour leader, he became um, cl quite close to her because he's, he was into farming and livestock and so on, just like the Queen. And she, he always he came out with a phrase which everybody uses, which is so true. She gives you friendliness but she doesn't give you friendship and friendship for the queen is reserved to the very, very few. And as the older she gets, the fewer and fewer there are. And perhaps today she's said farewell to her greatest friend, her friend for life, Prince Philip. Yes. Yes. Prince Philip definitely was her closest friend, Claire from when they started to write letters um, during World War II. That's, they started writing the letters to each other and um, what a trove of information that will be. So where, where are all of these letters stored? Are they, is this a special library in England um, to yes, have so, all of these or? Yes, they're stored at Windsor Castle. They, there's okay. there's a, a, basically a library there. And if you're a, an approved writer, um, you can go see some of the material. And, and, and so, for example, the letters between group cats in Peter Townsend and Princess Margaret are kept there. And they won't be released until, from memory, I think it's 2030. So oh. it seems a long way away, but it's not really, is it? <laughs> no, that's in 2030. That's just nine years. Yeah. So everybody must be somewhat circumspect what they put um, right on paper, pen to paper because well, they will stay, for, stay there forever. So you can't really have any private um, correspondence or what happens to emails nowadays? Well, exactly. I, uh, I, I, I wonder what's gonna to happen to biographers in the future because you know, so much of, his, of biography, just history is based on letters and, um, and, and memos and things. I mean, I don't, it's, I don't know how you're gonna farm the millions of emails which are sent sent out because many are just deleted or, right or very private okay so now there we do have a question now the first question so everyone in attendees in the audience please do send your questions you can see that andrew is very um willing to answer any questions what do the british people think of megan due to the oprah interview well, that's a good question. Um, I think, as a rough as a rough rule of thumb, younger people in Britain side with her. They felt that she could have 
she, she was, it was okay for her to articulate her grievances. People of color tend to side with her. Same in America. Older people tend to think that you should not wash your dirty linen in public, that, she's, that she and Harry, by the way, have betrayed their, the, the, the Queen's trust by saying what they said. And um, there's obviously concern about uh, allegations of racism inside the royal family or inside the royal household. Uh, and the, the, the bizarre response to Meghan's mental health crisis while she was pregnant with, uh, with Archie. So lots of different considerations for everyone to think of, very similar to what um, Princess Anne, when she said to um, Princess Diana that you have aired too much in public and I'm going to revert to being with the queen. You know, I can't, mm. I can't. So it's um, sometimes what things go around come around to the same, same, same thing. But um, Megan and um, Edward will probably just um, go about their own um, projects and he will um, come to terms with his brother for this funeral. As they said today in the funeral um, interviews and the funeral on CBC that sometimes funerals assist people with coming together for families to come together. Um, well, so that's, a, that's a good point, or, or, or it tears them apart. I mean, you know, the, there are plenty of funerals that people have talked about where the fights have broken out <laughs> between <yeah. laughs> warring relatives. So I don't think it's all sweetness and light, but you're absolutely right. It's very, very rare that the family get together in such numbers. So there will, there's no need for talking to private secretaries, the men in grey that we were mentioning in the interview, uh, they can, Harry and William and Prince Charles can speak face to face and, and, Will, and Harry can articulate his grievances and they can either resolve them or not. So it's a, it's a, it's a fabulous opportunity for face to face encounters. And of course, you know, and, and it's also done knowing that they're celebrating the life of someone they deeply respected and loved, Prince Philip. Yes. You know, I mean, if it, I can choose. Sorry. No, no, please go ahead, Andrew. I was just going to just going to add one of the things that that was great about the Royal York Britannia was that they had, would have these sea days where they'd bring on all these top industrialists, CEOs, and so on, and they would sit down and make deals face to face without all the deputies and hangers on there. And that was the the joy of that boat. It, it, they always used to say it made its money just by um, helping seal deals for British exporters. But, sorry, go on. No, what I was going to say is one of the reasons I think that Christine and I both who've talked separately about how much we loved your book is not only is it wonderfully researched and detailed and fascinating, but you feel like you're you're watching these real life, right, Christine, interactions. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely. watching... You're, you're, you have a front row seat. I mean, and, and the queen's sense of humor and the funny anecdotes, like the time that someone brought a creme brulee and she was with those friends talking about her friends and the creme brulee was so hard, she took off her shoe and she broke the creme brulee. I mean, these are, you think the, there's no way the queen would do something like that. And so you have this front row into these unbelievable family and interpersonal dynamics with history as the backdrop. And I think that's what makes it so compelling because you have incredible yeah, drama yeah. and you have history. I mean, I love that story of, of, of the Queen breaking the, taking off her high heel and smashing the creme brulee. I mean, <laughs> how many people would do that? But also, but, but it shows you how relaxed she was with her friends, with her. And it was the horse racing, the kind of country set, people in tweeds that, that she associates with. And then on another occasion, you know that they sat down to watch a race on a on the video in the days of videos and VHS, and the and there wasn't a seat spare for the Queen, so she just plonked herself down on the floor. I mean, you know, so she'll go from most high majesty to just you know sitting on the floor and smashing creme brulees. Right. Well, the picture that has just come out recently of uh, the Queen and Prince Philip sitting with their grandchildren um, was absolutely charming. Absolutely charming. And I'm sorry, I think I interrupted you. 
No, no, I, 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 but I mean, you're absolutely right. They, um, the Queen loved it up, up in Balmoral. And I mean, I've been loads of times up there. It's, and it's, it's one of my favorite parts of Britain as well. It's a beautiful place. Um, the River Dee goes through, people are f fishing for salmon. I mean, it's it's a it's a very relaxing place, and and I think you're going to see the Queen probably spending more time there than uh, uh, than even in previous years. So you've written so many biographies over your more than um, forty plus years of being starting off as a royal reporter, and then all your research. Um, can you talk about? What is your most diff what was your most difficult book to write? What took you the longest with all of the research? And how long does one of these books take? Because Elizabeth and Margaret, the research involved in it is infinite. Well, I mean, the most difficult book to do was the Princess Diana book, because that involved speaking to Diana, second guessing Fleet Street, which is a name for where the newspapers worked, second guessing the palace and making sure that Princess Diana was on side for the book that I was writing and making sure that, you know, that everything she said was backed up and endorsed by other people. So that was a difficult book that I've always said that that was a bit like playing three dimensional chess. Oh. Think of the Queen's Gambit. It was it was like trying to take on everybody. But the, the, the key thing was was being secret. Because if, if we'd have been found out, that would have been the end of the project. And who knows what would have happened. Um, that was by far and away the most difficult book and complex book I've ever done. Um, uh, and ultimately the most rewarding because it, it helped to give Diana a new, a new direction in life. I recently reread it and I found even greater insights, Andrew, than I'm just being honest than before. So if any of you have read it, read it again, just because especially with some time and what's going on with the Royal family, the work that was done and actually Andrew, I mean, how interesting once it was published, your own security, it must've been interesting, right, Christine? Like all of a sudden, like the, yes. the Royal family, the house of Windsor must be like, wow, who is this? I mean, they knew who you were of course, but wow, what is this? that's going on. And so, you know, that was well, also I, I, sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny though. I mean, my daughters were quite upset and they were only little at the time. And there were cartoons showing me at the, uh, in the Windsor Castle being stretched on a rack and the queen, <laughs> and the queen uh. looking quite satisfied with the, with the hangman's work. And uh, my daughters wow. saw this cartoon and burst into tears because they thought their dad was going to end up on the rack. Uh, oh. I, have, I have to say it did feel like that from time to time because the world and his mother was was very hostile because nobody realized that Diana was behind the book and that continued for a number of years until 1995 when Martin Bashir interviewed her for Panorama and she talked about you know her love for James Hewitt her, her isolate sense of isolation um and her husband's relationship with uh, Camilla Parker Bowles. Elements, all those elements had um, appeared in my book. And then you're even under further scrutiny or further being stretched on the rack? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, absolutely, yeah. So, yeah. Oh. so that was the most difficult one to do. So it, it ensures that every other book I've ever done was a walk in the park by comparison. Um, so you enjoy going to libraries. Perhaps our last question will be, do you have a favorite library to go to in the world? I know you talked about going to the Hoover Institute up in um, Stanford. Stanford. Um, yeah. Well, I like the Massachusetts Historical Society um, in Boston. That's a very, you can, you can sit there with the ticking of the clock and it's, mm. it's rather charming. The London Library and of course the, the, the British Library in uh -huh. Um, King's Cross is is a in a world famous library where where they keep every newspaper, every per periodical, and every every book. 
So do you have easy access to them or is it like going to the Huntington here, you become a reader? Have you, are you a reader? Yeah, yeah you've, got be, you've got to be a reader, absolutely. Yeah, I think the Huntington is probably the most difficult universe, uh, library to get into. <laughs> you needed endorsements from two professors, as I remember it. Oh, but I'm sure you have, the, you received them if you <laughs> and are there. Well, thank you so much, Andrew, for your time um, to visit us at Pasadena Library today on this very special occasion of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh's funeral, and also to talk about your absolutely fascinating, wonderful book. I encourage everyone to um, relive today's interview on Pasadena Library's YouTube, um, and also to get a copy of the book, check it out from the library or get one from Romans. And it's really nice to be able to have an autographed copy, um, to see your autograph in the library book and to have one in, um, from Romans for yourself. So thank you so much. I appreciate it very much. And thank you, Diana, for your um, wonderful questions and interview today of Andrew. It was a most enjoyable afternoon. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for inviting me and uh, uh, go independent, go independent bookstores. And uh, kudos to, to the Pasadena Public Library for now opening. And, and uh, I hope there's, the, now COVID is on the retreat, touch wood, um, many more people can enter your doors. We thank you very much. And perhaps one day we'll see you there browsing our um, history stacks and our biographies. And we have an extensive collection. So thank you again, both Andrew and Diana for a lovely afternoon. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you all. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.